and today our sermon is called Full Circle Miracles. Anybody ever had a full circle moment in your life that you've been like, oh, now we, it's just full circle. Um, about every 10 years, that's where fashion is. It's full circle. Um, a lot of you, if you kept your clothes from 20 years ago, you've saved a lot of money. Um, the, and jeans, just as in a constant cycle, they get tighter, 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 looser, 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 tighter, 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 looser, looser, looser. Oh, there's some holes now. Oh, there's cargo shorts. Oh, there's zip aways. Anybody remember those days? Um, there, everything becomes full circle. I got to go to my 10-year high school reunion. Some of you are like, wow, you're old. And some of you are like, wow, you're a baby. Uh, <laughs> my 10-year high school reunion about a month ago, and it was a full circle moment for me. I'm not going to talk much about it because I'm not one for gossip. It was interesting. That's the word that I will use. Um, I was... Shocked that I was the first one to get married, and I was the first one that we had a baby. I was, I mean, of course, when you see a woman that looks that good, you got to put a ring on it. You know what I'm saying? Like, Pastor, you're getting weird. Sorry, I'll get back on track. Full circle moment where I'm getting to hang out with people that I haven't seen in a decade, and it's just you're hearing what God is doing in people's lives and some what they're doing in their own lives, and uh, it, it's just these full circle moments, and it's it's always interesting to read through Scripture and see how God can take something that happened in the past and bring it full circle into the next moment. And as the Israelites have now crossed the Jordan River, they have made this memorial, these kerns, these stones of re remembrance. They step into three different full circle moments in an interaction with God. If you're joining us today and you haven't been here for a while, it's your first time. We've been reading through the book of Joshua and following the journey of the Israelites. The Israelites for many, many years were wandering in the desert and they were promised a land flowing of milk and honey. And they finally got to this place after the past generation had passed on. Joshua led the Israelites across the Jordan River into the first step of the promise. And in Joshua 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, last week we talked about how it said that the Canaanites and the Amorites heard what God had done for the Israelites and they were paralyzed in fear. Paralyzed in fear because God's people were on the move. They heard the footsteps of God's people. How many people walked around their house this week marching? Hey, devil, you hear me? I'm coming for you, brother. About to... Ryan said it, we about to kick you in the teeth. You ain't going to have none left after today. As they stepped in to the promise, they began to walk in a full circle moment throughout chapter 5. We're going to skip to verse 9, but to paraphrase up into this point, Joshua begins to walk through a, a recommitment phase in the covenant of what Moses and the God that have set up, and they all walk through circumcision who had not been circumcised up to that point to prepare them for battle. If you were ready to fight, we had to go back and recommit, re, uh, redo the covenant that we have with God so that we can step into what God has for us next. So anybody who was old enough to fight walked through this process, and in verse 8 it talks about how they were resting and healing. And then verse 9 starts like this. Then the Lord said to Joshua, today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. So that place has been called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the first month. So we know that this is four days after the Israelites had crossed the Jordan River. They walked through this moment of recommitment, walking through circumcision. Four days later, they celebrate Passover, which is a feast of remembering what God did when he freed them from the Egyptians. If you don't know the story about the Israelites, for many, many years they were slaves to Egypt and they were beaten. They were treated awfully. And Moses was sent in to Egypt to rescue God's people. And they went through many different uh, uh, phases of, of 
people would call them curses or different trials or things that they faced of frogs and fleas. And if you've seen Prince of Egypt, which if you haven't, you should because the soundtrack's amazing. And also the movie's very informational. They walked through all of these different plagues. And at the end of it, it said the spirit would go through Egypt and they were supposed to mark their door with the blood of a lamb. And if they marked their doorpost, the spirit would go by. But every doorpost that wasn't marked, the oldest child's life was taken. Finally, in that moment, Pharaoh told Moses, get these people out of here. And Passover was created as a feast of celebration of what God had done. So the Lord told Joshua, I have now ended the season that you have been exiting. And they sit down and they rest And remember what God has done. As I was reading this passage, I believe that there's a a very important part of it that God is reminding you of today. That he has rolled away the stain, the stink, the sickness, the death of your past so that you can step into who he has called you to be. It says, I have rolled away the shame of your past. Rolled away when you were in chains, bondage, slave to Egypt. And in the same way, God had rolled away the the shame and the bondage of their past. He has done for you and for me, but maybe only some of us have stepped into it. This is what I mean. You and I... We're destined for hell. We were destined for death because of a shame, a sickness, a bondage called sin. And God the Father saw that and he said, I don't want them to be destined for this. I want them to live in an eternal relationship with me. And because of that, I'm going to send my son down to die to bear a death that you and I deserve and live a life that we could never live so that way I could roll away the shame and the sin and the bondage of your past. And scripture says that when Jesus died, the veil was torn. What was the veil? The veil was a giant curtain. Imagine this is a curtain and there's another side of the building behind it and they were not allowed to move through that curtain because on the other side was the presence of God and only the priests were allowed there. There was bondage, there was a wall, there was a barrier that kept them from the presence of God, the Spirit of God, a relationship with the Father, which is exactly what they needed in order to step into the promise of eternal life. And when Jesus died, the veil was tore, and uh, God rolled back the shame, the sin, the bondage of who we were, and now we're able to step into who God has called us to be. If you don't understand it, let me say it real simply. You had no choice but hell. But because of God, you can now choose heaven. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, the shame of who you were doesn't have to be who you will be. Who you were The sicknesses of your family in the past, the decisions of your past, the stank of your past, the mistakes of old is not who God has called you to be. He will wash those clean through the sacrifice of Jesus and the repentance of our hearts. You can step into who God has called you to be and celebrate the day that you left slavery. In a few moments, I'm going to give somebody an opportunity here because you haven't made that real decision yet. Maybe you raised your hand when you were a kid and you said, I want to live in heaven forever. That's great, little Johnny. Okay, let's talk about that. What are we talking about again? Like that little kid, you know, decision. And maybe it stuck for some of you. I'm not speaking against it if you were young. But maybe some of us, even when we were older, raised our hand hoping to receive the promises of God. But we didn't change our lives. And it's not about raising a hand, it's about changing your life. It's about a transformation of the spirit. It's about a renewing of the mind. And I want to give you an opportunity to step into the promise that God has for you. Today he wants to remind you where you've come from and also tell you that he's not done with you yet. 
Come on, somebody thinks your story's over and you just got to settle for where you are. God is not done writing your story. The beautiful thing is that God writes with a pencil. I don't know why I said that. Maybe it's because I really don't like writing with pencils. But God writes with a pencil. And when he sees, oh, yeah, you did this, you did this, yeah, oh, the stink of your past, oh, yeah, your parents aren't saved, okay, yeah, all this. Okay, but, but you chose me. You repented. And there's this circled moment where he's like, all right, that's where they got it. And he takes their eraser, and everything is washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And it's such a simple picture, but I believe that there's somebody who needed to hear that today because you think that the track record's still there, but it's not about who you were, it's about who he is. And when your identity is found in who he is, who you have yet to become is still being written. Some of y'all need to take the journals of your past and all the junk and all the mistakes and all the bondage and all the things that are still weighing down on your shoulders. And you need to burn them in a fire pit tonight. I left mine here for a week and a half. Now you can take it out there, light it up. And we need to step into who God has called us to be. It's time to rest and remember. The next two words that I believe the Lord gave me was to reset and reload. The next part of this passage, verse 11 and 12. The very next day they began to eat unleavened bread and roasted grain, harvested from the land. No manna appeared on the day they first ate from the crops of the land. It was never seen again. So from that time on the Israelites, uh, the Israelites ate from the crops of Canaan. So as the Israelites were on this journey to the promised land, God would send manna from heaven. He gave them specific instructions. He told them, don't eat the manna of yesterday until it's the weekend. Gather enough for the Sabbath, then you're supposed to rest and eat that. And he gave them specific instructions. And God continued to provide day after day after day so that they could eat. They could be strong enough to continue to walk. But in this moment... The provision from God of yesterday was ended, and the provision from God for tomorrow began. And he said, from this day on, the manna never came back. But they stepped in and started eating the crops of the land of Canaan. Canaan had now been, the people had run off because of what God was doing to them. They were paralyzed in fear. They retreated. And they started to eat from the land of the promise. This was their first meal of the promised land. God fed them and and food followed them through that journey. But now they had a harvest that was ready to be reaped. I was reading this passage and I was wondering, if was there somebody who woke up the next morning and was looking for the manna to fly in? Okay, we've got all this over there, but then, you know, that takes a lot of harvesting and different cooking and thing, but this like thing that's going to fly down, I mean, we've been doing this. This is my routine. Come on, somebody, that'll preach. I know there's these beautiful strawberries and blueberries and incredible food that I can eat, but you know what? This is my routine, so I'm just going to go over here and wait for the manna to show back up. And I believe that God revealed that to me through the scripture because he wants to challenge you to stop looking and living off of the routine and the bread of yesterday because he has a new promise and a new harvest for your life. Pastor Mike and I always joke because the past nine months has been like a blur for us both. And we're walking through the lobby, and he's standing over uh, where the office used to be and tearing up a little bit, which makes me tear up. (laughs) And just like how much God has done in such a short amount of time. But if we look back and say, you know what, this is the way we used to do it. This is the way we used to reach people. This is the way we used to worship. And I'm I'm speaking from Multiply side as well. This is the way we used to do church. This is the way it used to work in the past. This is the way that I used to experience God. This is the way I used to serve. And we just keep going back to this routine and the days of old. And we don't look for the new promise and the new bread. We will start worshiping routine instead of worshiping God. God has new harvest for your life. 
the man is not coming back. And some of you think God's not providing because the way he used to provide for your life isn't showing up. But the truth is, it's not him not providing, it's him waiting for you to look forward because now you've started to worship the provision instead of the provider. And when we do that, he will reset our perspective. God has a new harvest for your life. Don't live off of old bread. Somebody had a huge experience with God when you were younger. Maybe it was a year ago. Maybe it was a couple weeks ago. And you've been clinging and holding to that. Get into your word. Continue to spend time with God because his mercies are new every morning. And he's not done moving in your life yet. I don't want to be the person who's got a full on garden and all of these beautiful crops of Canaan, yet I'm sitting here looking for manna. I don't want to look for the birds. I want to be wherever God is bearing fruit. Don't be married to routine. Marry the God who provides, because oftentimes we want to reload, we want to reset ourselves with the wrong ammunition. We were watching a show, some Western show, um, the other day to where somebody slipped the wrong bullet in someone's gun. And when they tried to turn around and pop, like, this town ain't big enough for the two of us, pop. And guess what happened? Eddie, what happened? It didn't work. It wasn't what he expected. But what we try to do is we try to reload our life and reset our hearts and reload the weapons that God has given us with old ammunition of an experience of when we were a teenager and all these things. And those things are important and we remember them, but they propel us into new experiences. They propel us into new steps. Just because you had a conversation that got somebody saved three years ago, God ain't done. He's got three more people for you this week. Don't reload with old ammunition because God is not done moving through you today. They rested and remembered. They reset and reload, and then they released and reengage. And these words don't make sense together until you read this passage. The band can come and help me. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in hand. Highlight that, underline that, circle it, star beside it, however you mark things. Joshua went up to him and demanded, are you friend or foe? Neither one. Some scriptures just say no. He replied, I am the commander of the Lord's armies. And at this, Joshua fell to his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The Lord commander, or the commander of the Lord's armies replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he's told. Come on, if this ain't a full circle moment, I don't know what is. They've walked through three full circles. Recommitment in this covenant that they made with the Father through circumcision. Which is the way they began. God started providing a new harvest. Which happened with the manna, but cut off the manna and did it again. And then God which most people believe that this is a uh, the presence of Jesus. This is Jesus showing up as the commander of the Lord's armies. Jesus shows up and tells Joshua exactly what he told Moses. Hey, take your shoes off, for this is holy. This ground is holy. And most theologians who read this passage and try to understand why in the world do they keep asking them to take their shoes off, it's because in the Jewish customs, when you would arrive to someone's house, if you were not in control, you were not the boss, you didn't own the recliner in the corner of the living room. Or in the corners of the living room. You took your shoes off, but the one who was in charge kept them on. And it signified that this was the boss. This was the leader of the house. And why God asked them to do that is, hey, I don't need you to take your shoes off because they're nasty. I need you to take them off and release control of what happens next to me. You see, because Joshua was walking around the outskirts of Canaan. As they're eating, he's probably thinking, okay, what do we do next? 
he knows that the next step, the next obstacle is the wall of Jericho. And this is not an easy feat. Yes, God has provided a way for us to cross the river. Yes, God has opened us a door for, to step into the promise. But now we have confrontation. Now we have to fight. And even with 40,000 soldiers of the three tribes, it's still not an easy fight. And Joshua was probably walking around thinking, what in the world do we have to do? And he sees the commander of the Lord's army. He sees Jesus standing there with his sword drawn. When you're walking around and somebody's standing next to you with a sword in their hand, I mean, you get a little worried, right? Like, what's about, what's about to happen, man? I'll bust you up. Take the Paul Blart movie, you turn your hip just around this way to cover that you don't actually have anything. He's walking around and there's somebody who has their sword drawn. Are you friend or foe? And Jesus in his humorful self just says, no. <laughs> like, what? Try that again. No. Are you friend or foe? No. Because I'm not from this world. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. And when Joshua thinks that he's going to have a moment of confrontation or just conversation, God calls him to release control. I believe that he's calling you to do the same thing as you're walking around your life and figuring out God has showed up, awesome. God's given us a church to be a part of, awesome. Yeah, God's provided, awesome. But now there's a fight, and we talked about this last week of preparing for battle. And crossing into the promise, knowing that there is a battle ahead, and we kind of freak out and we get nervous. Okay, so now there's the enemy starting to attack. Come on, families are feeling that in the house today. Joining a church family and sick and car accidents. We had this happen with Michelle's family of stepping into the calling. Can I tell you that the enemy is going to do anything he can to keep you from where God wants you? And we can either sit around and just try to figure it out on our own or we can take our shoes off and say, God, no matter what, no matter where, no matter who, God, you, I don't have time to serve. But God, you're calling me. How am I supposed to, no matter what, no matter where. We've got so many people in this church. That's my favorite kind of like, hey, Pastor Wes, what do you need? That's a great question. The answer is, ask Michelle or Mike. I don't know. But people who are just willing to help and step in wherever, because it's God, whatever, wherever you want me whoever you want me to talk to, whatever you want me to do. It's when you walk in that posture, when you release control, you can walk up to the walls of Jericho and laugh because you know how big God is. Come on, some of you are facing some tough situations in life. Sickness, struggling relationships, financial issues, and you're saying, committed ourselves to you, we're re reloading, we're eating, we're taking in your presence, but God, what is ahead is too big for me. God says, you don't need to figure it out. You just need to look to me. Somebody in the house has been challenged with a number, maybe it's for journey, maybe it's for something else where you're like, God, that's way too big. God says, you don't need to figure it out. You just need to look to me. Because it's when you keep your eyes on Jesus, when the resources that you're tapping into is heaven, the provision you're looking for comes from heaven, those things never run dry. But it's when we try to take things in our own control of, okay, we've got this many warriors, maybe we take this walls of Jericho. What's so funny is in the next chapter, and we're going to talk about this next week, God gives him the most berserk way possible to take down the walls of Jericho. Hey, let's march around and just scream. It's like, what, what did Joshua eat from Canaan? Let's just walk around and just yell. Because 
Jesus, when you keep your eyes on Jesus, he always provides a way when there's no way. Someone hasn't let go of a situation in your life, and today it's time to give him control. And when you give him control, he's going to show up and do what only he can do. Would you stand with me? He says, Joshua, I know what's ahead is frightening, but have faith. I know you don't understand. I know you hear the circumstances. I know you hear the struggles, but just have faith because God is right next to you. I was listening to this podcast uh, the other day, and they were talking about this African tribe who the process that they send their kids through to step into manhood. And what they do is they blindfold this young, young man and they send him out into the woods and they sit him down. And if he takes the blindfold off, it's like right before nighttime. If he takes the blindfold off, he's, he's not a man, he's not allowed to be a part of the tribe. But if he keeps it on until the sun comes up, staying in his place, he's accepted into what's the next season for his life. And I remember hearing this story, there was a guy who, you know, he was there on a trip or something and experienced this and he was watching this young boy and, you know, they're terrified at night because there's predators coming through, you know, all types of lions, tigers and bears oh my, and hearing the rustling of the trees and even the critters. I don't know about y'all, but like, I, I'm kind of like more afraid of fire ants than I am of lions and I don't know why I'm that way. Indiana Jones scarred me. And uh, he hears all this, and you can feel the critters walking around you and the rustling and the screeching and the yelling. And you know, you can be filled with fear because you don't see what's going on. And in that night, I'm sure that there's fear that stepping in, and because of that, he wants to lift up his blindfold just to make sure that he's okay. But he's not able to step into what's next unless he keeps it down so he doesn't give in to temptation goes through the night and even with the fear he continues to keep the blindfold down and as the sun rises and he hears, feels it warming up his skin he takes his blindfold and he lifts it up and it's day and he looks around and there's no animals but ten feet behind him is his father on 10 feet behind him is his father who was protecting him and there may have been prey there may have been predators there may have been all types of creatures around him that he didn't know if it was there or not they could have been as close at like four feet away from him and and ready to pounce on him but because his father was there to protect him and he walked in faith he's able to step into the next season of what his life looks like and I believe that the reason God asked me to share that story with you is because some of you are afraid of your situation. 365 times scripture tells you do not be afraid. Come on, there's one for every day. And you're saying, God, I don't know what's going on. God, I don't have things under control. God, I'm kind of freaking out. Our finances are in turmoil right now. My job situation, God, I, I don't have any security. God, I don't know the answers. God, I don't, I don't know the next steps to take. And what he's saying is, you don't need to have the answers. I am the answer. And I have not left your side. From the moment you chose me, I am standing right next to you, protecting you, saying, have faith. Walk by faith and not by sight. It is not about how, what you understand. It is about who I am. And someone in this house needs to release control today. Put the blindfold back down and allow the Father to play his role.